Ladies and gentlemen, sit down, grab some snacks, and get ready to have your mind blown, because you're watching the ups and downs of Nicolas Cage. Yes, hello, thank you, and welcome to the ups and downs of Nicolas Cage, where every week we take a look at the worst and the best that Nicolas Cage has to offer. As always, I'm your host, Logan Mock, and today is a Monday, which means we are looking at one of his up films. Today, we're looking at the 1997 blockbuster success of Face Off. Face Off was released in 1997, directed by John Woo, written by Mike Werb and Michael Connery, and on a budget of $80 million, it made $245.7 million at the box office, making it the 11th highest grossing film of 1997. The film follows FBI agent Sean Archer, played by John Travolta, as he takes on the appearance of Caster Troy, played by Nicolas Cage, in order to find out where a bomb has been planted in Los Angeles. When Caster Troy unexpectedly wakes up from a coma, he takes the face of Sean Archer and takes control of his life. This film is widely regarded to be Nicolas Cage's career at his best. And I understand it. If anyone knows John Woo as a director, you know that he's a very stylized director. He's a big fan of slow motion and random spots. He's a big fan of doves flying and birds being all over the set. And it's no different than this film either. A lot of that happens, and it doesn't seem too out of place. And that's... One sign of a good director is that his signature motifs can be in all his films and it never seems forced. The film suffers from what every 90s action blockbuster suffered from. It didn't have great visual effects at the time, so they couldn't remove wires that you could see at some points in the film. When they do close-up shots of the stuntman flying off of a boat, you can clearly tell that it is the stuntman and not Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. The makeup can seem a bit off, especially when they're showing the not-real faces of Cage and Travolta. But then you have to remember that it was 1997. They didn't have access to stuff that we had now. And if you're able to look past those small discrepancies... There's a really great film. The film strikes an interesting balance between symbolism and the blockbuster action. I found a few of the symbolisms. I'm sure I missed a lot more, but here it goes. The two main characters are Sean Archer, who's the good guy, played by John Travolta, and Caster Troy, the bad guy, who's played by Nicolas Cage. Caster Troy has a brother named Pollux Troy. And in Greek mythology, Caster and Pollux were two twins of different fathers. One was Zeus, one was the king of Sparta. And they are both given half immortality in order to stay closer together. And that is in the film. The two brothers are very close, despite the disagreements they might have. And when something happens to one brother, the other brother is concerned and obviously reacts. So, we learn in the film that Sean Archer's blood type is O negative and Caster Troy's is AB positive. In that symbolism, O negative is a universal donor, showing how Sean Archer has to always give. He has to protect everyone. He is the cop. He has to do all the good in the world. And AB Positive is the universal recipient, showing that Caster Troy always takes and takes from everyone around him. Also, Sean Archer is probably referenced to Apollo the Archer, and that constellation in the night sky of Apollo is on the opposite side of Gemini. And the main stars in Gemini are Caster and Pollux. That's pretty much all I can say about the film without spoiling it. So, after a quick ad break, I'll move into the spoiler section. Interested in making your own podcast but not sure where to start? Anchor makes it easy. 
Anchor has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And best of all, it's free. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. So the film starts off with John Travolta and his son on a merry-go-round. They're having a good time. They have some balloons. They're both smiling. It's a real happy time until Nicholas Cage steps out from behind a tree and shoots John Travolta. It was an assassination attempt, but he accidentally assassinated a child. We flash forward to six years later where John Travolta is chasing after Nicholas Cage who at this point is now a full-fledged terrorist for hire. He's planted a bomb in the L.A. Convention Center. He dresses up as a priest and is acting real creepy-like to this church girl. And we see John Travolta is kind of losing his mind in the attempt to catch Nicolas Cage. He's snapping at his assistants. He's getting frustrated when people won't give him what he wants to hear, showing that the emotional toll that his son's death had on him still affects him to this day. Eventually, they track Castor and his brother down to an airport, where as they take off, Nicolas Cage kills a few FBI agents. They get into a scuffle, and Nicolas Cage gets slammed against the grate, and goes into a coma. John Travolta is cheered at whatever agency he works for. Whatever, he's cheered for it, but he refuses to accept the champagne because of all the people that died. We go to John Travolta's home, and we see that his marriage is falling apart. They're not connecting, really. His daughter is acting out because she is still suffering from the death of the son. And then John Travolta interviews some of Nicolas Cage's accomplices trying to find out where the bomb is located. He doesn't have any success, so the logical solution is to take the unconscious Nicolas Cage's face and put it onto John Travolta's face. Then surgically alter every single part of his body to look like Nicolas Cage including his voice and his hair and his bone structure, and find out where the bomb is located through his brother, who is in jail. John Travolta, as Nicholas Cage, is in prison. He's looking for Pollux. He's getting into fights, learning to adjust being the man who killed his son. And... The acting that John Travolta and Nicolas Cage do of each other, pretending to be each other, is really phenomenal. You at some point forget that it's not Nicolas Cage being the good guy and John Travolta being the bad guy. They do a really good job acting. I've heard rumors that John Woo spread misinformation so that they'd do more comical and insulting impressions of each other. I haven't heard that's true or not. They seem to get along behind the scenes from what I've heard. And whatever steps they did take definitely paid off because the acting from both of them is phenomenal. Nicolas Cage, who being a terrorist, is completely unguarded in a state-of-the-art medical facility. I'm not sure why that would happen. But he wakes up, finds out that his face is gone, and has some of his goons kidnap the guy who did the surgery, put John Travolta's face onto his face. He takes over John Travolta's life. He finds the bomb, is paraded as a hero. Um, He's working on trying to be John Travolta. He's sleeping with his wife. He's... 
being weird to his daughter. He's trying to ruin his life and also take control of it at the same time. Eventually, Nicholas Cage... No. Eventually, John Cage escapes from prison and impersonates Nicholas Cage's life by going to his other terrorist friends, going to see Nicholas Cage's son, and eventually, Nicholas Travolta is tracking him down each time he's blowing up the places that he's been. He kills all of his friends, almost kills his son, and that's when his brother dies. And he's very emotionally upset of that, of course, and ends up killing an FBI agent out of anger. Luckily, there's no one else around to see that. John Cage eventually goes to his wife. He convinces her that he's the real John Travolta, just looks as Nicolas Cage, and with her help is able to set up a plan to get Nicholas Travolta into a place where he can capture him and put the faces back. There are a lot of really intense action scenes where there's explosions and guns happening everywhere. And the final action scene takes place in a church. And of course there's lots of symbolism with Nicholas Travolta standing in a Christ position, mocking him. John Cage. And sometimes the symbolism sort of hits you over the head, like when he makes the position of Christ, it flashes to the real Christ on the cross. Like, they kind of understood it. Like, the audience can understand what he's doing. It doesn't have to flash towards what he's impersonating. Ah, oh, no, scratch this part out. That's... No. Stop after the hits over the head with symbolism part. <laughs> then another action scene ensues where Jonathan Cage and Nicholas Travolta are fighting on a speedboat. John Cage is hanging off the side of it, skiing on the water with just his dress shoes on. And it ends in a climatic fight where John Cage is finally gotten Nicholas Travolta cornered. He tries to shoot him with a harpoon gun, but Nicholas Travolta grabs it, stops it from firing, and starts cutting his own face so that when John Travolta gets his face back, it'll look scarred, or he'll scar it so much that he'll have to wear the face of the man who killed his son for the rest of his life. But before that happens, a swift kick to the nuts makes Nicholas Travolta let go, and he dies. John Travolta gets his face back on, and then one scene that ends the film is something a bit weird. The mother of Nicholas Cage's son dies in this film. And so, John Travolta decides to take the kid as a replacement for the one that got shot. And that's fine, but he brought the son with him without discussing it with his daughter or his wife at all. And then, somehow, they're both cool with it. And the only discussion they have about it is... John Travolta says to his wife, okay. And then his wife says, okay. And that's it. An entire adoption of a son, a complete replacement of the son that they've been mourning for 60 years is just solidified with a quick okay from both parties. Oh, yes. And Nicolas Cage does die, meaning he's died in seven out of 
13 films. The odds of him 